just love you so much, Lord, and we thank you that we can be bound for the promised land, the happy land of heaven. And Lord Jesus, we thank you for dying on the cross for our sins. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. We thank you for making a way for us to be saved yes. and to possess salvation. Amen. What a great God you are. We don't take it for granted. Amen. Holy Spirit of God, we would ask that you would meet with us today. And Lord, we recognize we wrestle not against flesh and blood. We recognize that the, 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 the battle is inward. We would ask that you would help us to be able to cast down every imagination and be open to your Holy Spirit of working through the preacher today. Bless everything that we have, and we just ask that you give the glory and the honor in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Alright. Thank you, Brother Mike, for that. And uh, what a good Sunday school lesson we had this morning. Amen. We were reminded about praying for our missionaries, and uh, just thank the Lord for reminding me about those things. It's good to be reminded yes. about that. And uh, we've had a wonderful week wonderful week. It hasn't been, you know, a few comments, it hasn't been over top, it hasn't been all this sort of stuff, it's just been the simple reminder of the reality of what missions is all about. And uh, I firmly believe that the strength of the uttermost part of the world begins at Jerusalem. Yes. And Jerusalem is the local church. If our local churches are not strong, then our missionaries won't be strong. Mm -hmm. And so it's just good to have a missions conference to be reminded as a church what our responsibility is not just in going out and witnessing, but also giving and praying for our missionaries. And uh, that was exciting this morning. I've really been thanking the Lord for the whole week. It's been amazing. Amen. And I just want to thank Sunshine Baptist Church too, because you folks, the brethren here, work tirelessly, uh, cleaning, providing meals, picking people up, and uh, just uh, being friendly and uh, hospitable. And I just want to say thank you, church, for being a wonderful church. God bless you all. And it's a privilege to serve the Lord, isn't it? Amen. And, uh, it's wonderful. We just want to welcome some folks who are visiting with us. We've got some, uh, we've got some good shepherd spies up here this morning. <laughs> and, uh, we had a whole crowd of them on uh, Friday night, I think it was. Fifty-four of them coming here. We were jam-packed. It was exciting. That gave us a taste of what is about to come. Amen. And uh, we could have fit probably an extra ten more. I think we had estimated 120. On Friday night, so we had the upper room number on uh, Friday night. We believe in God for the power of Pentecost. <laughs> and, uh, God knows, but good to have uh, Robin and Rhonda Davis with us because we had their family on Friday night. Good to have our our back row. Right now I'm I'm learning the names. I'm learning the names. It's so good to see you folks with us. We just praise the Lord and just want to thank you for being with us today, and of course everyone else. And uh, I'm just excited. Uh, about what God has done. It's amazing. So anyway, I can grab on. It's not my turn to preach today. And uh, you will thank me when I start because, you know, I only preach for half an hour. What? Half yeah, an hour. Well, well, you know, give and take. So everyone's looking forward to when I get back in. It's like, can you preach for an hour and 20 minutes? Yeah, but uh, an hour and 20 minutes. Oh, an hour and 20 minutes. But you know what? The problem is that we in Australia are so soft, we can't handle that. We're like, man, I've got to get home, I've got something in the oven, there's my favourite TV show on it. And then we wonder why God's not pouring out His power and things are happening because we're too worried about leaving the church service. But uh, man, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it so much. Amen. So when I get back into the pulpit next week to preach, our, our uh, but anyway, let's take our bulletins. I just want to draw your attention to a few things in there. Just a few things in our bulletins. If you don't have one, raise your hand. The ushers will get you a bulletin. If you don't have one, all right, everyone's got a bulletin. Just a few things. Today is the last day of the missions conference, and uh, our theme has been the King is coming, and uh, we serve a wonderful King. Uh, do you love Jesus this morning? Amen. Amen. He's just amazing. We love Him dearly. Uh, we're looking forward to his coming. And it's a great motivator to get the gospel out. It's a great motivator to think, you know what, Jesus is coming back soon. Let's get busy yeah. telling people about the Lord. And I think as independent Baptists, I'm, I'm not preaching, forgive me, as independent Baptists, we've lost sight of what it's all about. We, we really have. Generally speaking, we've lost sight. We need to get out there and start with this thing. All right. On uh, Tuesday the 26th, uh, we have a members meeting at 6.30, remember that? Then on Sunday the 31st, we have a Victory Sunday, and of course that's, uh, that's Sunday of Easter there. And we'll get some flyers uh, printed up so that we can be inviting people to come yeah. to that service. So uh, 
just be praying about those services. Be praying about every Sunday service that God will do a work. Remember our missionary for the month is the Chris, uh, Chris Smith family there, Chris and Margaret there. And, and again, we were reminded, and I think, you know, whenever the man of God preaches, there's a, yeah, he just doesn't go through, uh, I don't know, Brother Quay, he just doesn't go through, oh, yeah, I like that one, I preach, I don't preach. I know that he wants the Spirit of God to lead him in what he preaches. And so, therefore, when the preacher gets up and preaches a message, I just simply take that that's God speaking to us about something. We learned this morning about prayer. And we, be, we need to be reminded, we not only support the Smiths financially, but we need to support them in prayer as well. Alright, we've got some March birthdays, so we want to wish a happy birthday to all of those who are having birthdays this month. Joan, Joan's having a birthday this month. Now, I'm not going to say how old Sister Joan. If you want to let people know how old you're going to be, that's up to you. Hey, but... I tell you what, she's on fire for the Lord. Amen. 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 We're excited about that. She's a bus. I want to come to church Sunday night and Wednesday night. We run our bus. We pick people. I love our bus. Amen. I love our bus. I love our bus. We pick people up, bring people to church. It's exciting. Sister Marsh is uh, having a birthday this month, so keep 72. them in prayer. She's what? 72. 72. <laughs> I can't say that because she's not here. <laughs> it's all on camera. Um, on a serious note, though, please keep them in your uh, We prayed for Pastor Marsh. She's just going through some health issues at the moment. And uh, just keep them in your prayers and ask God to do only that which He can do. God can do anything. And so uh, if you need to know any more about that, see myself or Brother Mike. He can share a bit more about that. But just keep them in your prayers with some health issues there. Brother Andrew Bott is having a birthday this month. Amen. What are you, 45? Ah, uh, 44. 44, yeah, close, brother, close. And he's a faithful man. So uh, why don't we sing happy birthday to these folks? One, two, three. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to the room. Happy birthday to you. We never get it right. No, wrong key, wrong words. Well, I tell you what, you know, dear brethren, God bless you. Then we used to sing the other one, don't have one, have two, yeah. all this sort of stuff. <laughs> that's it, take Christ as we say, and you have two. Alright, so uh, that's about it for announcements. Uh, let's stand, we're going to have uh, another song. Ushers, get ready, and we'll take up the offering. And uh, as we're standing, let me wait for the offering. And ask God to pray. Father, we love you. Again, we ask God that you would just grace us with your presence yes. this morning. We ask that, uh, God, you would speak to every heart today. Lord, thank you for the wonderful reminder of missions. And God, I pray as a church that we would take on board the messages that have been preached this week. May our hearts be continually stirred. I don't, I don't want the fire to die out just because missions conference is over. Lord, we pray that the fire in our hearts that has been set aflame will continue on. That the result of that would be that we will see souls saved. We've been handing out tracts this week. God, just because this is the last day of missions, we still have a mission to do. And so I pray and ask God that you would just continue to stoke those fires. God bless this morning. We pray and ask that you bless the tithes and offerings of your people. And God, we understand that ministries and missionaries need to be supported financially. And it doesn't matter what the world is saying or what the world is going through, whether it's a global financial crisis, nothing takes you by surprise. You do own the cattle on a thousand hills and the wealth in every mine. We know that you can provide supernaturally. You've shown that to us as a church, and we want to thank you for that. So bless now the uh, giving of your people in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. We're going to sing in 195, Look and Live, like a message from the Lord.
the Lord wanted me to say something about that song we sung just before that, and I didn't. And the words were this. It says, I will tell you how I came, hallelujah, to Jesus when he made me whole. Was believing on his name, hallelujah. I trusted and he saved my soul. What a great God we have. And I just thank the Lord for salvation. Amen. I thank the Lord that it has nothing to do with me. I am going to heaven. But it has nothing to do with me. It is because I believed on Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Yes. I tell you, I'm excited about being saved, and it's very precious. And I think of my son Isaiah, last year he trusted the Lord as his Savior. He got saved, Amen. and he's just obeyed in Christ. And what a wonderful privilege it is to be at Sunshine Baptist Church and have all of you helping us raise him and teach him and instruct him in the things of the Lord, even though he's a little rat bag. Oh. <laughs> what a blessing it is to know that my son is saved and we will spend forever in heaven. Amen. And uh, it's a blessing. And I trust that as you sing these songs, let's just not be religious. Let's just not sing the songs, oh yeah, that one again. Let's think about these and ask the Spirit of God to prepare our hearts for the preaching of the Word of God. And we can do it with the next song. It's hymn 484, still sweeter every day. Amen. It's the half cannot be fancy. Let's try this one together. <laughs>
Thank you, gentlemen. You may be seated, thanks. Um, say what, I've had this song on my mouth for quite a while. And I've practiced it this week, but I haven't scheduled it for this week. And I just really feel like the Lord wants me to sing it. And uh, you pray for me, because I had no intention of singing this morning. It's a song that means a lot to me. I got saved on January the 17th, 1989. I was 15 years old, I was at church camp. And it was the, uh, the time I, I prayed and I asked God to save me. The Lord did a great work in my heart. But there was sin in my life that I didn't get free from because I just wanted to hold on to it. And uh, it affected me and it, it bound me. I was bound by it. But the Lord freed me from it. I met my wife and he just broke those, the bondage that I felt like I was under. And I was suffering under And this song means so much to me. Amen. Amen. All right, that's just paved the way. 
for a message this morning. We've come to hear from the Lord. Amen. Amen. So yes. let's take our Bibles. Preacher, you come. It's been a wonderful, wonderful privilege to have you here. We love you dearly. Amen. All right, take your Bibles, please, uh, and open them to Luke chapter number 14, verse 25. Luke chapter 14, verse 25. Luke 14 and verse 25. Uh, I'd like to say, first of all, what a great time I've had for these few days um, up here at uh, Sunshine Baptist. I have enjoyed very, very much the, the fellowship. Um, I've gained about three kilos Amen. since I got here, and I promised my wife I wouldn't. I'm trying to to work on certain issues, and uh, you have not helped that at all. Um, you've been um, generous. I've enjoyed uh, not just the meal, but also the fellowship and spending time with um, each of you, the families that have had me. And unfortunately for my health, there is still more to come uh, today and tomorrow. And, you know, Sunshine Baptist Church, for, for some of you, I don't know you well, I first came to Sunshine Baptist Church, I think it was 10 years ago, and uh, we, we had some incredible moments here. Uh, I don't think it was because of me by any means, but I, I do know that I have seen this church uh, at what anyone could only describe as a mountain top. Amen. And, the unfortunate thing about mountain tops is they are usually preceded by and followed by valleys. And the valleys are never really fun. Uh, they're difficult. And there's no doubt that Sunshine has had its series of valleys. And I, I have a really strong feeling that the, the, the valley is at the backside. And it's the mountain that's in front Amen. right now. And it's exciting to be on a journey up a mountain. And I appreciate the, the, the way that these few families have been able to stay united. I know that there's been ups and downs um, uh, even since I was here last few years ago. But the fact that you are having a missions conference um, says to me you, you still believe firmly that there are mountain tops in front. Amen. Otherwise, you don't worry about talking about the world. You know, you might be talking about just what about us? You know, you look at the bulletin and um, you've got your financial report in there for February. So that just announces that we are not a rich church. And uh, when you see what needs must surely be there when you look at your general offering and then you see still the monies that are given to missions. Yeah. It, it shows, again, your confidence that there is a purpose that this church exists Amen. in. And it's not just to survive. It is to thrive. Amen. It is to grow. Amen. Um, the Lord, as we already looked at this week, the Lord did not give some small responsibility to the church. If the Lord would come to Sunshine Baptist Church and your charge, your commission was reach the people of Caloundra and the surrounding areas. That alone is huge. What's the population of the Sunshine Coast? Roughly anybody down? Three or four hundred thousand. Three or four hundred thousand people living on the Sunshine Coast. So if your commission, if the task, if the responsibility given to you was reach the Sunshine Coast with the gospel of Jesus Christ, that alone would be a nigh impossible task. <laughs> but the Lord is not one for giving responsibilities that are in the realm of possibility. Because if God gave you a responsibility that was possible for you to do, you would not need 
him to do it. Yeah. And you need to understand this about Christianity. What God expects from a believer once you're saved, it is an unreasonable expectation. God expects you to do things that when you are at your very best, you cannot do them. And God has set the standard so high that no man can reach it without His power. Amen. So that when you reach it, when you achieve it, you cannot do anything other than to say, to God be the glory, great things He hath done. Amen. All you can do is praise Him because you know what He did is beyond you. And when we talk about a missions conference, that's what this week has been about, you're talking about a small assembly of people here in Calandra called Sunshine Baptist Church who have been given a commission by the Lord, which was not reach Calandra, not reach the Sunshine Coast. It was preach the gospel to every nation and not in a general sense. God gets very specific because in Mark he says preach the gospel to every creature. Yeah, right. Now how's that for the realm of possibility? Even if we had unlimited resources and a hundred times the manpower, not even close. The only thing that it will take is a miracle of God. Now, God has tasks for us to do. Small tasks, big tasks. Jesus said something, the very last words that He spoke on the cross before He gave up the ghost, died for our sins, the last three words that Jesus Christ said was, It is finished. In John 17, before He went to the cross, He said to His Father, He said, I have finished the work that Thou gavest Me to do. The Apostle Paul, as he gets to the end of his life, he says a statement like, I have finished my course. I have done what I've been asked to do. If you've been saved, if you've been a Christian for a while, you'll understand that receiving Jesus Christ as your Savior, getting saved, is the beginning of a fantastic journey. Amen. Because after you get saved, God is going to begin teaching you, speaking to you about His purpose for your life. What does God want me to do in regards to this great commission? But sad to say, most people, most Christians, will get to the end of their life and they will not finish what God gave them to do. You listen to lots of people share their testimony and they'll, they'll talk about regrets they had and how they got sidetracked and how they, you know, and the truth is they didn't finish. Now, it's one thing to start well. But... It's all together uh, something different when you finish. Luke chapter 14, verse number 25. Luke 14, verse 25. And there went great multitudes with him. And he turned and said to them, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life, he cannot be my disciple. That's kind of a... Uh, I, I don't know how I like that. You know, Jesus, we're always trying to bring the crowds, bring the crowds. Jesus sees this crowd following him, and he stops and says, Ah, if you don't hate your father, mother, brother, sister, even your own life, you can't be my disciple, and you're wasting your time following me. And then he keeps walking. Uh, Lord, were you seeking disciples, or were you trying to uh, push them away? But he was doing something. And we'll see in a minute what he was doing. Verse 27, and whosoever doth not bear his cross and come
come after me, cannot be my disciple. Now, cross, people today like to put cross necklaces on. Do you know, if I could put that in modern, that would be like putting a noose around your neck. A cross was simply a method of killing people. People who were condemned to die were nailed to crosses. Death penalty. And Jesus said, if you don't take your cross, you cannot be my disciple. Verse 28. Then he says something interesting. For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first, and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it? Lest happily, after he hath laid the foundation, and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish it. What does it take to finish the race? When you look at children, children get excited to start something new. But after a while, they lose interest and don't finish. Christmas time is always funny to see this happen. Parents are always thinking, what am I going to buy my kids for Christmas? And, uh, if that's what you do, and then you go out and you buy something that they've said they've always wanted. And so Christmas comes and they open it up and they say, oh, I always wanted this, I always wanted this. They open it up and they start playing with it. And after about 15 minutes, they're like, uh, did I get anything else? Yeah. <laughs> or you're going to build something. Legos. You're going to build a big tower. Oh, two layers in there. They're done building it. People are like that. Life is like that. People get excited when there is something new, something different to try. But often they don't finish it when it gets boring. Now, I've been in the ministry for about 18 years or so now, and I can tell you that observing Christians and observing church members, I can tell you my observations about this start and finish. Many start out on the Christian life excited and on fire for God. They want to serve Him. And then somewhere along the lines, they fall away. And you, you've known people who were saved, baptized, into the church, on fire for God, and you could probably list some people today that are sitting at home, not going to church, not interested in the things of God. They started, but they didn't finish. Mm -hmm. Some people get excited for a ministry that God has given them, but they find out what everyone finds out is that all great ideas are accomplished with lots of hard work and lots of monotony and lots of repetition and lots of day-to-day tasks and a lot of people get excited to start something but they don't finish it. Right. People get married, they fall in love, they start off their life together and they say until death do us part but they don't finish. Proverbs 24, 21. My son, fear thou the Lord and the King and meddle not with them that are given to change. Change is that idea, oh, this was interesting, but nah, not really. let me try this now, and let me try this now. And believe me, this will all have to do with missions here. Imagine being that first little church at Jerusalem with 11 apostles, and then a little group of 120, and you've been given a task of reaching the whole world. You don't have to read much of the book of Acts before you find out there was immediate and constant opposition and obstacles to getting the job done and anybody in their right mind would have said this is hard enough I'm finished not finished I quit but you know what you say people often when they say I'm finished now they mean I, I quit let me give you a couple of things today number one he said in order to finish verse 28 first you have to count the cost now, if you were a builder and you were going to build an apartment complex or build some, you guys go all those condos and units up here, you know what you do before you build it? 
you have to do some counting first. You have to count, first of all, what is it actually going to take to build it? And I learned a long time ago that there is a, a job for someone that's called a quantity surveyor. What a nasty job. <laughs> if you're going to build the World Trade Center, you know, they're rebuilding that in New York, you have to count things like how many nails will be used. How much cement is going to be used? How many iron rods are you going to have to put for the foundation? How many screws are going to be necessary? How many windows are going to be in that building? How much insulation? How much? How much? How much? How much? Can you imagine if that was your job to count? Now, I believe that they've created a lot of formulas now. You know, so you don't have to stand with a tape measure and keep on you know, going like that, you've got some formulas in there, but it's still a nasty job. The banks have quantity surveyors, so if they're releasing funding for you to build something, they have a whole lot of calculations and they're always counting and counting and counting and counting and counting. Why? Well, if you're building the World Trade Center, you don't want to get three quarters up the way and suddenly you say, I don't have enough money to pay for the rest of that building. Wouldn't that look pretty awful? Three quarters of a building built and there it sits for the next 20 years as a, as a mockery of someone who didn't count the cost. Now, Jesus is giving an illustration of how foolish it would be to start building a building before you've already planned the cost of finishing it. And what happens to a lot of Christians is that they do not count the cost. They start off by saying, Lord Jesus, I am going to follow you wherever you go. I'm going to do whatever you say. And they make that statement without counting the cost. And Jesus saw this multitude of people that was following him, and he was going to prepare this people to take the gospel to the whole world, and he realized they had not counted the cost. So he says to them, if you don't hate your father and mother, you cannot be my disciple. Now, I had a problem the first time I read that. Because the Bible tells me to obey my parents, to honor my parents. The Old Testament says if you don't obey your parents, they could actually take you and stone you to death. Why would he now turn around and say, hate your father and mother? I thought God so loved the world, not God so hated the world. Well, when you start to study Scripture, you understand that it doesn't mean what you think it meant. Let me tell you what it means. When I got saved and became a Christian, a real, true, born-again Christian, my parents were not happy. We had grown up in this Lutheran church that did not preach the gospel, that did not leave, live a Bible-believing life by any means. And when I left the church that my parents were associated with, and I wanted to go over to this church, my parents said things like, how can you do this to me? It was offensive to my parents that I was not following their religion. And because I was not following their religion and going somewhere else, it was almost bringing some sort of a shame and a reproach. And it could be interpreted as, you hate us. If you go in countries um, like where I'm at in Fiji, where you've got the indigenous Fijians and you've got the Indians who are Hindu and Muslim, you need to understand, if you've been brought up in a Hindu or a Muslim family, and you convert and become a Christian, in some places, you could not do anything more devastating, more painful, and more hurtful to your parents. When I first met Pastor Shemesh preaching in um, the U.S., he had a Thai young man with him. I, if you may have met him, he sort of takes this guy with him where he goes. And this young man was telling me the story I think it was on his 21st birthday, or 20th, he's the only son, and there is a ritual of some sort where he was supposed to go with his father to the temple. I, I can't remember 
the whole bit that was around it. But it's something that the father would have saved money for a long time to do. It is the most significant way for him to honor his father. And when he finally had told his father, I can't go and I'm not going, it, it was taken as a very painful insult. And Jesus said, you need to understand that if you follow me, it may be that your own father or your own mother will misunderstand you. And when you have decided to follow me, it may be against the wishes of your parents and it may put a sword in your own family. And if you cannot follow me, taking the consequence with your family, you cannot be my disciple. When I went off to Bible college, my mother would not tell me goodbye. It seemed like I was hurting my family, the direction I was going. I thank God years later that everything has changed. My mom is saved, my dad is saved. They love the Lord and they are serving Him. And they don't misunderstand me like they misunderstood me before. But when I felt like following the Lord was putting a division in my family, I had a choice to make. Do I keep unity in my family or do I follow the Lord? Do I do what their dreams for me or do I forsake it all and follow the Lord? And you need to understand that cost. Right. Count the cost. There's a sacrifice involved. We live in a generation where people are always looking for something that cost nothing. When God designed the plan of salvation, when God looked down at this world of sinners, the plan to save sinners involved sacrificing His Son. Jesus would have to come onto the cross take all of your sins upon Him, and He would have to suffer and die. God could not save us without sacrificing His Son. Romans 8.32 says that God spared not His own Son, but delivered Him up for us all. Amen. Yeah. Amen. King David, in 2 Samuel 24, needed to to make a sacrifice. He had, he had done something foolishly and a, a, as a result of his foolish decision, the judgment of God was upon Israel. And David needed to make an offering. He needed to make a sacrifice. And uh, a gentleman by the name of uh, Aruna, he said to David, take this field, take my bullet, take everything. I'm giving it to you. Make your sacrifice. And David said, no. He said, I will not offer burnt offerings unto the Lord my God of that which cost me nothing. He'd already learned that following the Lord, there is a measure of sacrifice and cost that is involved. What makes a successful marriage? Ephesians 5.25 says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. You know, in order for me to be here today preaching to you, you do understand that there is a sacrifice my wife's had to make in our marriage for me to do this. My wife is home in Fiji in a third world country with seven children, and over the last two days all her texts to me have been um, how absolutely miserable and sick she is over these two days. And I don't know why it always seems to happen when I go. It's almost without fail. And there is a sacrifice that she makes, that my children make. But we counted that cost a long time ago. We knew if we step into the ministry, if we decide to serve the Lord, there, there are unavoidable sacrifices that are going to need to be made. And we have to count that cost before we start down the journey if we're going to finish what God has called us to do. And you need to understand that as well. Following the Lord is going to have cost associated with it. In Acts 15, in verse 25, another missionary, Barnabas and Paul, they had been doing missionary journeys. They had been sent from the church at Antioch, and they were traveling all around that lower Asia area. And this is what the Bible says about them in Acts 15, 25. It seemed good unto us 
being assembled with one accord to send chosen men unto you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men that have hazarded their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. To, to hazard your life means you willingly put your life in a place of danger to accomplish your goal. Since their goal was serving the Lord and there was danger in the pathway, they'd already counted the cost. They were willing to go through hazard. Why? Because they had a tower that they wanted built. A cost. Let me tell you why Christianity is so weak today. Christianity is not weak because Jesus is weak. Right. It's yes. not weak because God is weak. It is weak because of the state of the Christians. Yep. We are living in a very comfortable, modern life where we can serve God without cost. We can serve God without sacrifice. Believe it or not, we live in a very wealthy generation. Amen. The things that we would consider uh, normal, like air conditioning, for example. You do realize that King Solomon, who was the wealthiest man that ever lived on the earth, never sat in an air-conditioned building. <laughs> you do understand that he never rode in an airplane, not even coach. You do understand that Solomon never drove a car, never had an engine. You understand that he didn't have sewer systems like we have today. You understand that many of the modern things that we consider average, normal lifestyle, the wealthiest kings of generations gone by, did not have what you have now. And we still talk about how poor we are. Yeah. And what we do... We give of ourself to God and we give of our resources to the Lord without ever actually needing to sacrifice anything. And that's why we're not going anywhere. We're not building any tower. We're not, we're, not, we're not building something great for God. We are not seeing the mighty moving of God because we've already counted the cost that it would take to do it and we are unwilling to pay that price. You know, back in the United States of America, I believe I've done my own observations and surveys and I am quite astounded at how many missionaries are on what we call deputation. And deputation is where they are going to churches and telling people about the country that God has called them to go and they're raising support. And that support is to help them get to where they're going. The average missionary spends three years. Three years going church to church to church to church to church, to church and I kept thinking, well, first of all, that pattern's not in the Bible. That's my first problem. My second problem is, is that how broke God is? That a missionary has to be effectively a beggar for a three-year period to scrape together enough to go to the mission field? Is there not enough money within the 10,000 independent Baptist churches that are in America, isn't there enough money in there to get all of those missionaries to the field today? Oh, yes, it exists. There's plenty of money. I received a letter one time from a uh, uh, church that had 1,500 members. They've been supporting me $100 a month, and they wrote me a letter that they were having to revamp their missions program because... Um, they had their own college. They wanted to support their own missionaries. And I was not in the in crowd. So they were going to have to drop my support. They couldn't afford, what they said, to support their own missionaries and little guys like me. I got on the church's website. And they just completed a $3 million renovation of their church building. Wow. The front of the church... The rock wall. I I figured 
that each one of those rocks cost $100. And I thought, there's my support. <laughs> they bought a rock to beautify their building. For their college, they spent another several million dollars building for their 150 students. They built a gymnasium and aquatic center for their college that had a retractable track, millions of dollars. So while they are beautifying their building and expanding it and doing this, they're writing letters to missionaries saying, we can't keep supporting you. We don't have enough money to do it. Right. I was happy not to get their money. I don't want money from those kind of people, to be honest with you. Yeah. I did write a letter back. Dear church, thank you for your amazing sacrifice for the Mears family over these years. I do understand the financial hardships that you are in. May the Lord bless you and da 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 And then at P.S. I was on your website and saw the beautiful multi-million dollar renovation to your church and God wouldn't let me send it. <laughs> God said your motive is wicked in that letter. I typed it, I signed it, I had it in the envelope and God would not let me send it. He said, I'm not going to let you. I'm not going to let you open your mouth and act like a fool. When I talk about sacrifice personally, if you actually took your 24 hours a day or 7 days a week, and if you quantified how much sacrifice have you made of your own time personally for the work of the gospel, compared to the time you spent, let's say, watching television, which one would have a greater portion of time? I mean, just, I'm just being real down on the earth level where we are. Go look at your money. Go, go get your restaurant receipts. I mean, just get the receipts from, and I'm not saying don't go to a restaurant or lunch. I'm planning to go there. But I'll tell you this. I, got, I give to missions. When I first got saved and I learned about missions, I committed $7 a week I was going to give to missions. I was excited. It was my own heart to the Lord. And my prayer to God from that day has been, Lord, I pray that by your miracles you will allow me to increase and increase and increase and increase and increase. Um, because I, I, I just want you to have what I have for the world. And I guarantee you my restaurant bill doesn't even come close to my missions giving bill. I'm not meaning that in a boasting way. I'm simply saying to you, the fact that we can spend the dollar amount that we do on food and on pleasure, and you match up what you invested to that world out there, there's no sacrifice that's involved. Sacrifice to me carries the idea of inconveniencing my lifestyle. I wonder how many people for what they do physically for the Lord and what they give to missions, I wonder how many have had to readjust their lifestyle to accommodate how they've given themselves to the Lord. You see, God gets the crumbs that fall from the master's table. God gets the leftovers. When we've given the best of our strength and the best of our day and the best of our mind and the best of our labor, if there's anything left over, that's what we sort of partially give to God after we've watched our programs. So sacrifice. Number two, the motive. Now, to finish the task that God has given us, I've got to count the cost. Am I willing to sacrifice God may not ask me to give my life and go to the mission field. He may not ask me that, but He may. And if He asks me, will I go? The second thing has to be our motive, the glory of God. Speaking about finishing, look at John chapter 17, verse number 4. Jesus finished His task, and I want you to see motive in finishing. John 17, 4. Jesus speaking to the Father in heaven, He says, I have glorified Thee. On the earth, I have finished the work that thou gavest me to do. I have glorified my Father by finishing His work. Notice His motive. Why did Jesus persist in His work? Why did He finish the task? 
because the motive of his heart was to glorify his Father. Doing the will of God and finishing what He gave you will many times go against the desire of your heart. We have a lot of selfish thoughts and motives that run through our heart. And it's very possible for you to actually do Christian work with a motive that is not to glorify God. I am a preacher. You know what we preachers have to do? We have to stand in front of people all the time. One of all the requirements is that we be humble. You just need to know it's it's it goes against human nature to stand in front of crowds and be humble. Especially if God uses you. And it, it is our expectation that God would use the preaching and use the teaching, and if God does use it, people are going to get saved, people are going to get convicted, people are going to grow, the church is going to grow, missionaries are going to be sent, and if a preacher is not very, very, very careful, his motive, his raw motives can sneak up on him, and suddenly there's a bit of pride that comes in there, and like, you want the church to be full so you can feel good about yourself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I had to learn that about me preaching to an empty little hall with a few people in there. And, you know, one Sunday it's really full and suddenly you feel good. And the next Sunday it's half full and you feel bad. The Lord had to check my spirit about that. God said, you know, you do that because it's about you, not about me. You're not jealous for my glory. You're feeling bad about yourself. Motive. The glory of God. If at any moment you stop thinking of the glory of God and you focus on yourself, that's where temptation comes to quit serving God and do something else. Revelation 4.11, one of my favorite verses in the Bible and one of my favorite scripture songs, says, Thou art worthy, O Lord. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. For Colossians 1.16, For by Him were all things created that are in heaven and in earth. And it says they were created by Him and for Him. Amen. I can't divorce my wife. Do you know why I could not divorce my wife? One reason alone. You say, do you really love her? I do really love her. But that's not why I stay married to her. When I stay married to my wife and I humble myself to the biblical teaching about being a husband and I give her the love and the cherishing that she needs and that she deserves, I am doing it because that's what the Bible taught me. None of us would be good husbands without that Bible. Amen. And you'd not be a good wife without the Bible because it's constantly showing us we're doing it wrong. If we let our human nature and we let our own flesh take over. That's why divorce is rampant in our generation. Because people are doing it for self. Most people get into marriage based on what it can give me. What it will do for me. Why are you fighting? Because she did that and she didn't do that. And he's this and he's that. See, we are so selfish in our marriages. It's about what we take out of it. It's not the glory of God. If your marriage, if your motive was the glory of God, you'd be amazed how many times you have to shut your mouth. You'd be amazed at how many things God won't let you say because God says, that's for your flesh. That's for your flesh too. That's your ego. That's your pride. You're a selfish husband. So there are, there are things I cannot say to my wife. There's a way that I cannot treat her. One, I cannot say it and treat her that way because I love her. But what about when I'm being fleshly? Then what? Can God be glorified by mistreating her? If my marriage ends up in divorce, can I end up in divorce and then say to God be the glory, great things He hath done? No, I can't. The glory of God. If that's not the motive of your heart, you're not going to finish anything. Thirdly, the will of God must be your purpose. The will of God. John 4, 34. Still speaking about finishing, finishing your task. 
In John 4, 34, Jesus said, My meat is to do the will of Him that sent me and to finish it. He said, This is my meat. This is what I feast on. This is what I eat. I must do the will of the one that sent me and I must finish it. His will is my life's ambition and my life's desire. I thank God when I got saved, I had a preacher that just kept drilling and drilling. You are not your own. You are bought with a price. God has a purpose for you. God has a will for you. Nothing else in life matters. Nothing else is important. Know the will of God. Do the will of God. I learned that I don't have the right to choose a destiny. I don't have a right to tell God what I would like to be able to do. I learned from the Bible that I have to lay everything aside and say, God, why did you create me? Why did you put me here? What is your purpose for my life? I'm just waiting for you to tell me, and my answer is already yes. Amen. There was a three-year period of me not getting any real answer from God. What's your will for my life? What's your will for my life? What's your will? Why did you make me? Why am I here? God couldn't tell me yet because I was not ready, really, in my heart to hear what He was going to have to say. It took years for God to work on lots of little things to get that old heart where it needed to be. And I can tell you the last thing on earth I wanted to be was a missionary. Even when I went to Bible college, we had to sign up to be a pastor's major or a missions major. I said, I am not being a missionary. Pastor. That semester, we had two choices of electives, youth ministries or missions. I said, forget missions, I will never be a missionary. I'll have to work with youth, so I'll take youth. Eight months after I signed up for that, ten months after I signed up for that, I was in Fiji as a missionary. <laughs> but I want to tell you this, ladies and gentlemen. I want to tell you this. I am unbelievably grateful to God that He has shown me why He made me. I am so glad. I'm not guessing day by day. I meet people all the time. What's God's will for your life? Well, I'm not really sure what God wants, but you know, so I'm just, I'm just working here and I'm just going to church. And but what is God's will? I am so glad I don't have to answer with an I don't know. And I'm, if I had time, I could tell you the exact steps and the ways in which God made that known to me. But then you would probably adopt it as a pattern. Because God has His own way of communicating to each person His will. And you don't have to worry about how God will speak to you or if He will speak to you. When your heart is in the place it needs to be, yep. He will speak Amen. to you. And it will be so clear you can spend the rest of your life being driven every day because you know it. I wake up every morning with the honor of having clear instruction from my master as to why I am on the earth. And I don't want to get to the end of my life and say, well, Lord, I gave it my best, but, you know, I couldn't really finish it. That's why sin scares me. It scares me. I don't, I don't want to, to, to do something where I have to resign as a missionary. I don't want to. I want to get to the end. I want to say with Paul, I want to say, I finished my course. I finished it. I'm done. The will of God. Kids are going to school and people say, what do you want to do when you grow up? Who cares what you want to be? That's the problem. The problem is you want to be something. That's the problem. That's not the right question to ask our kids. The question we ask our kids, do you know God's will for your life? Do you know what God wants you to be? Do our kids even know the process to go through, to learn, how to find out what God wants them to be? Fathers, do you realize you can't tell your kids what to be? Mothers, you cannot tell them what to be? Pastors, you cannot tell them what to be? Only God can reveal why in eternity past He chose to create that person and what their task on earth is all about. And I believe the reason our churches are so ineffective 
in getting the gospel done is there is a bunch of self-willed people doing what they want. Amen. You ask people, why did you go to church today? If people were honest, they will tell you, I felt like it. Why didn't you go to church Sunday night? Ah, you know, I didn't, or I, or... You see, don't expect God to give you a spot on the map to do when you don't learn the basics. Do you know why I go to church? Simple. It's the will of God. It is the will of God for you to assemble. It is not the will of God for you not to assemble. Now you can talk your way around that all you want, but I've read His Word and I know what the Bible says. It says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, as the manner of some is. I said, God, I'm not going to be the sum in there. I want to do what you say. So I go to church. I cannot think of a time the church would call a meeting of the members that I would go, huh, oh, you know, I think I won't go. I'm not allowed to think about commandments. It is the will of God. There are so many things in the Bible that are the will of God. Clearly, they just say, this is the will of God. This is the will of God. That ye abstain from fornication. I love some clear verses. And in order to avoid fornication, 1 Corinthians 7, it says it is good for a man not to touch a woman. So here's what God's Word says. Don't touch women. Don't commit fornication. So don't touch them. But to avoid fornication, get married. So that means if I'm not married, I don't touch. I mean, handshake touch. That's why the first time I kissed my wife was in a pulpit in a platform in front of people because first he said I now pronounce you husband and wife and then I grabbed her and kissed her because there was no longer any biblical boundary to that Amen. that's why I don't do dating I don't do anything like that because when I look in the Bible I read what it says and what it does not say and then people say oh you're old fashioned but no I want to know what is the will of God what does he say it doesn't matter how I feel I know how I feel about girls I know how I feel about relationships of course I would want a girlfriend I didn't go to my senior prom because I got saved that year and I found out that listening to that kind of music and doing that kind of dancing was not honoring to God and so I didn't go to my senior prom and people thought I was gay because I didn't go Yes, believe me, nothing wrong with the hormones. They're all working in good shape. But I'm not following them. I'm not supposed to. I'm supposed to read the Bible. I have to tell you something really funny about this. In my church, we were a little tiny church. We'd been through a kind of nasty split. And uh, they needed Sunday school teachers. And I was not saved long, but I was willing to be involved. And so I needed to learn. Well, the only Sunday school teachers were women. So my pastor said, I want you to go down to the Sunday school class my wife is teaching. Just sit in the back and observe so you can see how Sunday school goes. So I sat in the back and she talked about dancing. Her whole lesson was about uh, evil dancing and different things. And I'd never heard that before. And at the end of her Sunday school lesson, she had every, all the girls bow their heads and close their eyes. And uh, she wanted them, how many of you would commit that you won't go to your high school or your school dances or anything like that? And I'm sitting there in the back. As the observer, when she said that, I stuck my hand straight up. And I, years later, in fact, about three years ago when we were back in the States, I asked my pastor's wife, do you remember? And I gave the story, and she said, I will never forget it as long as I live. I said, why? She goes, because you were the only one that raised your hand. <laughs> I didn't care. I didn't care if I was going to miss what some of us thought was the biggest event of our whole schooling life. You crowd it with that senior prom. I didn't care if I was going to miss it. It didn't matter anymore because why in the world would I want to do anything that my father was saying, that's not my will. I read the Bible and it says, prove all things. I am to take every issue of life, compare it to the Bible, prove it whether it's the will of God or not. But that's not the attitude of our churches today. It's not the attitude of Christians. So we're not easy to maneuver. God can't put us where He wants to put us, when He wants to put us, how He wants to put us to finish this task because we're too busy doing our own will. The glory of God, the will of God. Well, something else to finish is there's going to be a fight. You ever heard people say, a fight to the finish? 
Well, 2 Timothy 4, 7. When Paul talks about finishing, he said in 2 Timothy 4, 7, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. Who are you going to fight? Not a fist fight. Right? I'm going to have to fight my own heart and flesh. I'm going to battle right here. This is going to be my first battle. You're going to fight your heart and your emotions. And let me tell you something about your heart and where this battle is. Proverbs 28, 26 says, He that trusteth in his own heart is a fool. It's very possible right now that your heart is already debating the things that are being said this morning. Jeremiah says that your heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. 2 Corinthians 7, 5, Paul said that without we're fighting with inward fears. You know, we went out letterboxing yesterday. I've been, I've been soul winning now for the last 20 years of my life. Why, when I got out with those handful of tracks, was there already a fear within? Why, after all this time? I wasn't actually knocking on doors. This was just letterboxing, just putting it in the letterbox. Why was it when I walked up to a letterbox and someone was sitting on the porch watching me do it? Why was there a fear within me? Why was that feeling in me that thought, don't put it in that letterbox, he's probably not going to be happy that you did it, just move on to the next one. Why? You think 20 years into this, those type of thoughts wouldn't even come into my mind. No, I want to tell you, Corey Mears does not like to confront people he doesn't know with the gospel, not my style. I can preach in front of all of you people just fine. You walk through the door knowing I was going to preach and you wanted to listen to me. It's I know that. I'm very comfortable, very able to do it. You get me in front of a group of people who I'm pretty sure don't want to hear what I have to say. It's not my nature, okay? Some it is. Some they don't seem to, it doesn't seem to bother them at all. It bothers me always and every time. And I figured 20 years later it would be simple. Well, why do you keep doing it? Well, because I'm not following my heart. I'm not following my heart. God loves that person. I don't really love them as much as God loves them. But he loves them, and he said, preach the gospel to every creature. And they fall into that category. So I have to ignore my heart and do the will of God. And I have to be ready for a fight. I have to fight myself. When I first, I was at Bible college doing soul winning. And I would drive my car into a street, and I'd look at all the doors I'd have to knock there. And you know, I said, because I already know that. Nine out of ten of them are not going to be happy that I came. And I'm a people pleaser. I like people to like me. That's my nature. And I would sit in my car and stare at all those houses and I wouldn't go. And I kid you not, I heard one preacher say it and that's what I did. I rolled my window down and I threw my car keys. You know why? Because I got to get out of the car. I, need, I needed to do some strange things like that to get me out of the car. And when I would get out of the car, I'd lock it and I'd have my tracks. And by the time I got walking down there, I'm like, okay, I can keep going. I'm right here. Let's just go a few more steps up to that door. And you know, I come back sometimes with the neatest experiences of people whom God had touched. And I would, I would be so happy I went, but I didn't feel like that before I went. I have to battle within my own heart and my own flesh. There are spiritual powers. Ephesians 6.17 says that there are principalities and powers and rulers of darkness that we wrestle against. That means as I do the will of God, Satan is opposed to it. You want to have a peaceful life? Do your own will. Uh, many preachers have said it. Why do all the battles begin after you decide to serve the Lord Jesus? Well, are there any Afghan Taliban shooting at your head right now? Any Taliban shoot at your head lately? Right no, because you're not in the battle. But go sign up for the army, put on a uniform, fly over to Afghanistan, and walk into their neighborhood, and you see how many bullets come flying at your head. 
Satan does not bother people who are not serving Jesus. He, in fact, Satan wants to keep you satisfied and happy when you're not in the war. So he gives you, he even gives you good things when you're not in the battle. But you step on the front lines and you start committing yourself to the will of God, commit yourself to soul winning, commit yourself to missions, commit yourself to this and that, and I promise you, you will face satanic battles in what you do. But you win them. The gates of hell shall not prevail. Amen. You fight against the lure of the world. 1 John 2.15, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. James 4.4 4 says he adulterers and adulteresses. Know you not that friendship with the world is enmity of God. That world just keeps on pulling, doesn't it? Keeps on pulling, keeps on pulling. I have to fight. And I have to fight according to 1 Timothy 6.12. I have to fight the good fight of faith. I have to fight it. So I want to ask you a question. Very, very simple. Will you finish the course? Or will you die unsatisfied knowing Really, you finished very little of what God put you on this earth to do. So you need to count the cost. Is there anything today you will not be willing to let go of if God asks you to do it? Anything? What? What? What if God said to you, "Ah, oh, just empty your that big old savings account and just..." Say to the pastor, I want this all to go to missions as the Lord leads. Now, I'm not saying God would ask you to do that. In fact, He probably won't. My question is, if He did, would it matter? If He did, would it matter? Is your security in that? Is that why you have money saved for security? If God told you to give your house away, give your car away, give everything in, if God told you to quit your job and, and present yourself to the pastor and say, Pastor, I believe God wants me. There's a spot on the globe. I don't know where it is, but I believe that's where God wants me to go. I'm going to leave my business. I'm going to leave my... Reminds me, reminds me of a friend of mine who was selling Jaguars. So it's, it's an American car. And preacher, he was giving $20,000 a month to missions. Not his tithe, to missions. And he told me, he said, every time a missionary would come through, every time, he said, I always had my checkbook open. And he said, every dollar, he said, at the end of every month, I emptied my bank account. All gone, every month. And he said, I just waited for God to tell me where the money was going to go. And I was happy to spend the rest of my life just designating money wherever God wanted it in the kingdom. And he said, then a missionary came up from Brazil. And was uh, retiring. He was old, and he was he was talking about how many cities with over a million people still did not have one gospel preaching church. And Brazil is what we would call a highly stocked country as far as missionaries are concerned. And this brother said, "I went down to the altar and I said, God, uh, how much do you want me to give? I'll empty it out, Lord. I got eighteen thousand or whatever it was in there. Lord, I'll empty it out." And the Lord said, uh, "Not your checkbook." You're going to Brazil. After God had thoroughly dealt with his heart, he went to his pastor and he said, Pastor, God has called me to be a missionary to Brazil. Now, if you're his pastor, that presents an interesting problem because that guy's given 20,000 bucks a month to missions. And if he goes to Brazil, well, and he's best said, Son, let's pray about this for a while. Let's really sing the Lord's will. <laughs> No, Pastor didn't do that at all. Because Pastor understood that money is nothing. That's God takes Amen. care of all of that. Amen. He walked away from a job. Now, if you were giving twenty thousand missions, what would the total income be? Filthy amount of money. So he told me. Now I met him. Uh, we I'd known him years ago before he was saved. In fact. And so we met up at a church, we're preaching in the conference, and oh, 
I said, how's your support doing? He said, it's about up to 1,200 now. Okay. <laughs> he's, he's earning 1,200. And he said, yeah, we're, we're deciding whether we eat McDonald's off the dollar menu or whether we just go buy some bread and make some sandwiches tonight. How can you walk away from all that? But he said to me, he said, it wasn't a problem. Having money to give or a life to give, he said, it's all the same. It's whatever, whatever God wants of you. Right. You live for the will of God. You do it for the glory of God. You count the cost ahead of time and you already say, God, I am willing to give whatever you want. And I'll tell you, I've watched people lose a loved one and it absolutely destroy them. I love my wife and my children more dearly and more precious than anything on this beloved planet. And when my third daughter, Sarah Beth, was born, she was born premature. And we'd always, like as soon as the babies were born, we'd always had a sweet little family prayer and dedicated them to the Lord, etc., etc. And by the third day, we thought she was going to die. And I remember when my wife and I went back in that room again, because although we had already prayed that we had surrendered and given her to the Lord, that incident showed us that we actually had not. And we had to ask each other, are we willing to willingly give this daughter to the Lord, and if God wants to take her to heaven, does God have the right to do that? Will it destroy us? Will it destroy our marriage? Will we be in bitterness? Will we be in depression? And there we said, God, this little girl is yours. And three days is what we get with her. Three days is what we enjoy with her. And that, I've never forgotten that moment. And each time I, I get on an airplane, I remember one time, my wife and all my children, my mother-in-law, they got on a plane to Australia. They were headed up to Canberra to visit some missionaries there. And I was getting on an airplane to go all the way to uh, the, the Midwestern part of the U.S. I would be half a planet away from my family. And at the Milsori Airport, I actually was at the end of the runway, and I watched the airplane take off, and I realized everything I love dearly is in that little tube up in the sky. And tears were coming down my face as I was asking myself the question, if God decided it fit His plan to take my whole family away from me, would it destroy me? Would it hurt me? Would it make me quit? Or could I let God have my family and could it be an act of worship if that's what He's wanted? And I, I hope God never makes me go through that. Amen. But I would like to know that living or dying, here or there, nothing matters because it's all about God. You've already got everything. Everything I have, I've sacrificed, and it's already yours. And if it was to your glory, so be it. If it's the will of God, that's fine. Whatever fight is in my path, God, give me the grace to stand to that test and that fight. And brothers and sisters, unless we live that way, unless we believe the way I've described it now, you get to spend your life, like every other unsaved person does, coasting through life with a life that doesn't mean much. And you may think that you're not worth much, but I'm telling you, you follow the, what I've shared with you from the Bible, and God will take what appears to be an insignificant life. And God will mold it and make it, and you will accomplish things far beyond anything you ever expected because of God putting you in His hand for His work and for His glory. God specializes in the foolish, weak things of this world. Amen. Sunshine Baptist, what are you going to do? I'm excited, really excited. Because I know where your heart is. I really believe I felt your heart this week. And that's thrilling to me. But you're not going to see the fulfillment of the vision without this. And I hope today that you can bow before God and say, Okay, God, I don't even know if I know what it all means. But Lord, I want to count the cost today. And I want to say, God, I'm taking my hands off of my life. And I am giving it wholly and completely to you, God. You can do whatever you want. Lord, and I'm not doing it for me. I'm doing it for your glory. If anything that you want will glorify you, I will do it. Please, God, show me your will. Make it clear to me, God, and I will do it. Do you know if you do that with all your heart? What a journey. I did not know when I said that that it would lead me to Fiji and the South Pacific. Never dreamed I'd be standing in 
in Australia. Never dreamed I'd be a preacher or a missionary. God, God continues to surprise me all the time. But I know if I had not dealt with these issues here, God couldn't have used me. I would have been a stumbling block too often of the time of what God wanted to do. Preacher.